in the interest of time, we're going to start with the second Jera Science panel. Moderator is Steve Ostad. Steve, can you hear me? Please take I, the mic. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to today's session on Jero Science, which is uh, called uh, Ready for Translation. And I'm thinking that maybe there should be a question mark after that, Ready for Translation. So let me just introduce today's uh, panelists, and, and then we'll run right into the show. So I'm Steve Ostad. I am, uh, I direct the uh, UAB Nathan Schock Center of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging, and I am the Senior Scientific Director for the American Federation for Aging Research, which has uh, been advocating for clinical trials in aging medicine. Uh, the first speaker will be Vadim Gladyshev, uh, Professor of Medicine and Director at the Center of Redox Biology, uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Next will come Aubrey de Grey, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of the SENS Research Foundation. Then Vittorio Sebastiano, who is at the Stanford Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, and also co-founder of Turn Biotechnologies. Uh, and finally, Greg Fahey, who is the Chief Scientific Officer and a co-founder of Intervene Immune. And so let me just describe quickly the run of the show. Each of, the, each of our panelists will give a roughly five to seven minute uh, talk. Uh, at the end of that, we will have some discussion among ourselves. And at the end of that, hopefully with about a third of the time remaining, uh, we will entertain questions from the audience. And I urge you to put those questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, but in the, the Q&A. Uh, so that we can take a look at those and answer them uh, as that uh, time becomes uh, appropriate. So let me set the scene before I turn things over to our panelists. From my perspective, the world is currently facing an imminent, dangerous health problem, health threat. Millions of people are already being affected, many millions more will be on are worried about it. There's a scramble on to find some sort of preventative or cure. There's a number of promising leads. Uh, we're waiting for, the, for those leads to be sorted out for appropriate trials to be performed so we can determine the safety and efficacy in the hopes that very quickly the best of these will become uh, available on a massive scale. And as I hope you realize, I'm not talking about COVID-19, I'm talking about aging. And what I'm talking about is the dramatic increase in global age that's happened over the last century and continues uh, to happen. So what today's uh, uh, session is going to do is identify some of those promising leads and discuss how promising. Uh, I also hope we can have time to discuss, are there special considerations that we need to do in trials of these kinds of preventatives? What is a pro plausible timeline? What, if any, barriers might we uh, encounter? So without taking up any more of the uh, panelists' time, I will turn uh, things over to Vadim Gladyshev. Vadim? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, may I have my slides? Yes, um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, since uh, this is a session on ready for translation, I thought uh, it's worth uh, discussing a little bit what we are going to translate and what is, what is the, our target. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, so uh, this slide illustra illustrates our target, uh, which, is, which is aging. So, uh, this is a metaphor for water flowing from the pipe and uh, aging direction is the vertical direction. We could slow it down by um, developing uh, uh, geroprotectors, uh, uh, interventions that slow down the aging process, for example, calorie restriction, rapamycin, metformin, and, and other. And uh, this, this is kind of obvious direction. Um, and I, I guess most people in the field uh, pursue this. But, but at the same time, we also would like to um, take uh, uh, us from uh, down the line in the, aging, uh, in the aging direction and actually bring, bring back, uh, in other words, rejuvenate an organism. And uh, the examples of rejuvenation are in display potent stem cells and, and partial reprogramming in vivo. So uh, I guess now it's, um, it actually we know that it may be possible, it may be difficult, but it may be possible. Next slide. 
And I, I would like to spend just a, uh, a moment discussing uh, rejuvenation a little bit more because um, in, in what I think there could be considered partial rejuvenation, complete rejuvenation, uh, the question is whether we target an organism, uh, a mammal, human, uh, and whether we could completely rejuvenate it is kind of unclear. So, um, so in this um, slide, just upper, slide, upper green circle on the top, you can see cell senescence, just as an example. So if we target uh, uh, an organism senolytics and uh, to remove some senescent cells, presumably an organism could become just a little bit younger. It would not be completely rejuvenated, but some elements of the organism would be rejuvenated. In the same way, an orange circle on, on the kind of 5 p.m., um, place. It's going to be uh, partial reprogramming in response to epigenetic aging. So, but at the same time, uh, in addition to this partial rejuvenation, there is a complete rejuvenation, which is represented by circle in the middle, um, which is represented by conversion of somatic cells to induced pluripotent stem cells. And, uh, and, and as well as a, this fictional, fictional example of Benjamin Button, uh, if anybody watched a movie or read a, a book by Fitzgerald uh, describing this kind of reverse aging, which of course is not observed uh, in real life. Next slide. So uh, in order to uh, identify uh, interventions that uh, uh, kind of slow down or reverse this process, I, I, would, I would describe basically our, our strategy. And uh, what we do, we develop this so-called longevity signatures, which represent the potential of the organism to live long. It's not, it's not age-related changes, but really uh, indicate a condition which would change a, a system, change an organism, remodel it, or reprogram that uh, would, would place an organism in a state which it would live longer. Next slide. And uh, this is represented by several signatures. One is evolutionary signature. Uh, this is a, a cross mammals that we study and in, in which we try to understand how nature ch changes lifespan. Because clearly there is a great diversity in lifespan in, in mammals over a hundred fold. And apparently it is possible to change many fold lifespan by nature. Of course, it takes millions of years, but if we understand how it does it, we could, we could uh, utilize a similar strategy. Next. Uh, similarly, there is a, a, a signature based on known interventions in mice and, and we characterize what is known um, in terms of the omics approaches uh, by taking the best, best examples of, of interventions that extend, extend lifespan. Next. And also we characterize these signatures across cell types because different cell types in, in, within the body, they uh, have a quite different lifespan. And then we integrate all, the, all of the signatures to, to come up with kind of uh, longevity signatures which we are, we are using. Next. And this is one example of, of how we do it. Uh, this is interventions uh, uh, in mice, known interventions. And this is a Spearman correlation matrix kind of uh, relating one uh, to another, uh, all of these interventions. And, and uh, you can see a, a cluster on the top, uh, top left uh, red cluster. And you can see that many interventions remodel organisms uh, in a similar way. For example, calorie restriction is somewhat similar to methionine restriction or every other day feeding and many generic models like FGF21 overexpression or growth hormone receptor knockout. But then there are other interventions which are quite different. So apparently there are many ways to extend lifespan in mammals. And um, this is also a, a tool for us to, um, uh, to, to combine interventions uh, uh, because we need to know what we are combining if we're combining interventions that act through a similar mechanism or different mechanism. Uh, next. And then we use the signatures to screen um, uh, databases and uh, chemical libraries. And uh, this is just an illustrative example. Uh, on the uh, upper part of the, of the figure, it's a screen of public data. Basically, we just go to databases and use our signatures, which are shown uh, on the bottom, uh, some of the signatures here, um, and screen conditions. And we find a situation when um, uh, this data is, support both reduction lifespan and extension of lifespan, and some interesting candidates can be identified, for example, 
uh, keep one knockout or hypoxia or other interventions. And on, on the lower part of the figure, some of the compounds that, that we found in a chemical screen, and, and here we, we screened the chemical library of uh, over 3,000 compounds, and uh, then um, uh, repeated the experiment, uh, recapitulating this in primary cells, uh, in mouse hepatocytes and human hepatocytes, made diets with these compounds, gave to mice, and then the data shown is actually uh, this omics um, kind of uh, evaluation of, of interventions in mice. And then we, uh, our best candidates are being uh, tested for lifespan extension, and we already have some candidates which, which do extend lifespan, so apparently uh, the, this approach works. Next. So, uh, but I wanted uh, uh, just bring it a little bit, um, uh, give a, a broader, uh, I would say, a view of this. And so our goal is to screen uh, for aging and rejuvenation. So uh, what is our overall strategy? Next. Here we, uh, uh, as I told you, we define long-lived states based on longevity of cell types, mammals, and, and interventions, arriving at longevity signatures. Next. Uh, in parallel, uh, we have to develop um, aging clocks because when we test interventions, we, um, it's often uh, advantageous to quickly uh, uh, test uh, a, a potential for, for the intervention to extend lifespan. And for that, uh, of course, it's useful to have um, uh, clocks uh, pioneered by Steve Horvath and now just kind of really expanded. But it's not only epigenetic clocks, but all kinds of other clocks that, that can be used based on uh, chronological age and, and also for phenotypes. And, and we also have this uh, aging signature, which is age-related changes, uh, again, by omics approaches, which are also useful uh, uh, as a part of the aging biomarkers. Next. And, and the third component of this, uh, I already implied it, that we also look for rejuvenation. And um, uh, this is a completely separate signature because uh, it, it's not necessarily the same going from younger to older state and going from older to the younger. We really have to look into the basis of aging to identify conditions which uh, uh, kind of illustrate uh, or represent the rejuvenation process. Next. And uh, this would result in candidate compounds and factors that can be tested. And uh, my opinion is that we need many compounds to be identified in mice before we go to humans. Next. And um, another I I issue, um, and this is represented by a paper that, that we published uh, earlier this year um, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Giro, uh, then uh, that actually uh, we found that every, every uh, organism, every human has this highly damaging mutations which shorten lifespan. So um, uh, we found out that um, uh, this MEF uh, on, on the left, uh, minor allele frequency, that uh, ultra rare variants which uh, uh, disrupt open reading frame, disrupt the gene, even in the heterozygous state, they're highly damaging. On average, uh, each person has about six such mutations. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they are basically shortening lifespan. This is illustrated on, on the right, this kind of square, where we um, uh, split uh, these uh, mutations, uh, organisms' mutations into bins, and survival uh, is shown for bins with the higher number of mutations and lower number of mutations. You can see that even within several years, we could see uh, survival differences among those people. On average, each mutation shortens lifespan by, by six months. So uh, again, so when, uh, uh, when uh, clinical trials are held, I think it's important to, have to, to, to use this information to, to increase the power of the uh, in, um, clinical trials. Next. And finally, I wanted to say just a, a couple of words about COVID. Uh, we, have, we have a couple of studies uh, uh, shown here, and the findings are that COVID is basically uh, a disease of aging because we observe a very similar patterns of case fatality rate and all cause uh, human mortality rate. They uh, increase exponentially uh, and uh, double approximately eight years. So uh, it's very well known also that men and those with comorbidities are more susceptible. We also found that lung ACE2, which is the receptor for COVID-19, uh, for coronavirus, uh, uh, increases with age uh, in subjects, not on ventilator. This is in the lung. And also we found that genetic variation that supports long life is actually protective against uh, COVID-19, which is again, uh, suggests that the role of aging itself 
uh, in, in the susceptibility. And, and finally, we also uh, found that elevated biological age is associated with severity of COVID-19. This is based on different um, clocks um, uh, that uh, track the aging process. What this means is that uh, we think that uh, this strategy is possible. Uh, we call it target the virus, strengthen the host, uh, which, which means that in addition to antiviral approaches, of course, uh, we could target the aging process. And if we could uh, decrease the biological age of an organism, of, of a person by maybe just one year, we probably could increase the, the chance of dying maybe by 20% or so. So this, this is very significant. So I, I think there's an opportunity for us currently to test uh, candidate interventions, uh, anti-aging interventions in, in COVID trials because uh, COVID is a disease of aging uh, and th this would allow us to test it quickly and uh, inexpensively uh, and actually help uh, real, real people who, who, especially elderly who are infected. Of course, this is being discussed by, by many these days and, but I still wanted to bring this um, this point maybe for further discussion. This is my last slide, so that's it. Thank, thank you, uh, Vadim. Uh, let's move on to Aubrey. Before Aubrey starts, I wanna remind everyone that if you have questions that you'd like to raise, please use the question and answer box that's at the bottom of your screen. Aubrey? Uh, thanks, Steve, uh, and it's great to be here. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna try and limit myself to just five minutes. Um, and I really want to pick up on three things that have already been um, touched on by various people. Um, I'm going to start with the question of um, translation. Uh, so Steve at the beginning suggested that it wasn't clear whether the um, uh, field is ready for translation. And I think that indeed the question of whether it's ready depends a lot on what you mean by translation. That is a word which is not immune from the phenomenon that we see so often in this field of words meaning different things to different people. Um, and we heard it, of course, just at the beginning from uh, Thomas in his introduction of the word metabesity. Um, so um, for me, the uh, real question is the difference between, some, uh, between work that is curiosity driven and work that is goal directed. That I would say is the, um, the broadest possible definition of translation is if, it, if you, you can see where you're going even if you don't know how long it's going to take you to get there or how many steps and so on. And Sense Research Foundation is really engaged in translational work in that broad sense. Once something becomes more narrowly defined as translatable, as in, for example, it's in the clinic, it's kind of no longer our problem. Um, so I would say that at this point, we have reached very clearly the point where, by the uh, broader definition of translation, we are ready. The um, next thing I really want to talk about is that, um, if, you know, how we got here, why we are ready for translation. Um, and here I really want to echo a lot of what Vadim just said. Um, I think, you know, it's perhaps easiest to explain where we are by explaining how we got here. Um, so, you know, once upon a time, there was geriatric medicine in like the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, we understood that people get sick when they get old. And we didn't really focus on the distinction between the ways in which people get sick in old age relative to early age. So we tried to attack these things in more or less the same way. And of course, there was great success with regard to the ways in which people get sick early in life. And um, so we tried the same kind of thing. We tried to take each individual um, way in which people get sick and cure it. And sure enough, we didn't get very far. So for the bulk of the 20th century, uh, of course, we saw the emergence and progression of the field of gerontology, which tried to cope with this and to um, leverage the fact that these problems of late life all happen progressively and are, of course, asymptomatic for many years. And uh, that led to, of course, the era of theories of aging, where different people had different beliefs in the field with regard to what was the number one unified driving force that could be called the aging process. And it became a bit religious, to be honest. In fact, sometimes even the language was religious. So, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, frivolous people used to talk about the Taoists and the Baptists. Um, 
And so, you know, this was an, an era when, of course, much progress was made, but it also kind of ran into the sand. And this century, everything has come right. Basically, the field has come to the conclusion that the correct way to think about the problem of late life uh, ill health is somewhere between the previous two, such that there is indeed a multiplicity of processes going on during life that eventually make us sick. Uh, and there is extensive crosstalk between those processes, but it may, it, it, it's counterproductive either to try to unify them into a single process or to dissect them into individual diseases of old age. And this concept, which, um, you know, was uh, really pretty new, you know, I was one of the earlier people to talk about it just 20 years ago. It's now become very much accepted, one of the, probably the, um, paper that describes it most um, effectively from 2013 has become basically holy scripture within the field. So I think this is really how and why the field has reached the point where we can start moving forward so much faster and so much more confidently towards eventually keeping people healthy late in life. And that brings me to the third thing I wanted to talk about, which is kind of an introduction to the remaining speakers namely the translation of this work from the academic setting into the private sector. That is something which is kind of another definition of translatability, investability. And again, um, you know, people would typically have historically thought about investability as being more or less synonymous with clinical translatability. In other words, you start a company when you're ready to start clinical trials. But what we have found over the past five years at most, and arguably only over the past two or three years, is that there are investors out there who get this, who understand that the eventual revenue and uh, profitability of this field will be just completely astronomical, and therefore that it makes sense to get involved at an earlier stage with higher risk than one would in a typical sector. The result is that investors have been writing respectable sized checks to fund projects that are still even two or three years away from their first clinical trial. And of course, this has resulted in considerable acceleration of the work that had previously been funded only by governments or by philanthropic organizations such as mine. Um, so this really is why we can now really feel very confident and happy about the way that things are going. The timeframes, of course, are still very speculative. I'm delighted to see that some of the experts in the field are now uh, joining me in the view that there, there is benefit in talking about timelines, even though those predictions are extremely speculative, simply in order to dissuade people from presuming that this is still all snake oil and science fiction. And I think I'd like to stop there and let the um, private sector people um, take over because I think the way that the private sector is going is really the main reason why we can have so many conferences like Metabesity. Thank you. Thanks, Aubrey. Uh, let's next turn over to Vittorio Sebastiano, who will talk probably about a specific um, um, avenue of research. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, and I want to thank uh, also uh, Vadim and Aubrey because actually they brought up uh, some very important uh, and introduced, you know, some very important and key concepts that actually are going to help my my short my short uh, you know uh, spiel here. Yes, we. Um, well, Fundamentally, I like very much what Vadim showed, you know, in her in his first slide. So there is, you know, if we imagine uh, uh, aging as a as a water flow that progressively and irreversibly kind of, you know, goes downhill, uh, and you know, culminates with uh, with frailty at some point. Uh, you know, there's various, various ways to think about slowing it down, but then there is, you know, one fundamental uh, way actually to, to, to bring the water back uphill, uh, basically by providing energy to the system, you know, in, a very simple, in very simple terms. 
And so what we, what we have shown over the past few years, uh, we published a work uh, early this year, uh, we have shown that actually that energy that you, know, you can introduce to the system uh, can be the, uh, what we call uh, ERA or epigenetic reprogramming of aging. I mean, the, the term is a little bit misleading. Uh, I, I couldn't come up with any better acronym, quite honestly. Uh, misleading, not because uh, uh, it's not epigenetic. It is epigenetic, absolutely. It's in part epigenetic and we, we have shown that. But I think it's kind of a little bit of a combination of epigenetic, metabolic, uh, and transcriptional uh, activation that all together brings the cells, you know, uphill uh, or brings the, you know, the, 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 the age uphill uh, to a point where the cells, you know, are now more, more youthful, more functional uh, across pretty much all the hallmarks of, of aging. And I agree with Aubrey. I think that, you know, the field that has, you know, dramatically, dramatically uh, kind of, you know, um, moved uh, forward over the past few years. Uh, a seminal work has been, you know, like the really the identification of the hallmarks of aging. There's still a lot of controversy, and this is something that I would like to kind of, you know, bring to the panel. Like, uh, there is still no consensus about, you know, what aging means, uh, you know, at the cellular level, at the tissue level, at the organismal level. Uh, there is not a, a unifying way actually to say how this happens. And, and maybe that's fine. I mean, maybe there's a multiple ways to, to, to measure that, but we still lack really a, like a very uh, quantifiable, you know, uh, measure of, of that process. Um, but, you know, uh, long story short, what, what we believe, you know, in my lab and of course at Turn as well, which is the company that is a, is a, is a spin-off of, of our discovery, what we believe is that uh, regardless of what the hallmarks are, regardless of what the trigger of aging, what the causes of aging are, fundamentally the linchpin of aging is uh, uh, an epigenetic drift. So an accumulation of epigenetic mistakes that over and over and over time, you know, bring to, you know, a point of uh, you know, no return. Uh, and so that's exactly where we think uh, we, can, we can intervene. Uh, where are we? Well, we are at the preclinical stage. Uh, we have uh, uh, decided for a number of reasons to start with dermatology uh, because, uh, well, for various reasons that, you know, are not necessarily, you know, <laughs> that have nothing to do with uh, cosmetics uh, or beauty or as, as some may, may think. No, it's, that's, that's not the, the, the driving force. Actually, we have, we have started with dermatology because from an interventional standpoint, uh, the skin is, you know, the most uh, available <laughs> tissue, uh, easily available tissue in the in the in the body. So from a from a from a from a practical standpoint, it's much easier actually to develop interventions for for the skin. There is a number of of indications within the skin that seems to be a very simple organ that can be tackled. Uh, that can actually be informative, very informative for other indications that could could be developed down the line. So this is kind of you know our uh, our f uh, test field actually for other types of intervention that will be developed uh, you know, down the line. Um, and uh, uh, so from a safety standpoint, you know, it's, uh, it's absolutely, it's absolutely you know, important uh, and a primary target. Um, and uh, the bottleneck, uh, of course, is in vivo delivery because we're working with mRNAs. So in vivo delivery is absolutely you know, the, the, the key for us. And that's where we have spent most of the time so far to really make sure that we can effectively deliver in vivo the, the, the reprogramming factors. And you know, so uh, where are we? Very close to um, phase one. Uh, so we are expecting within the next uh, six months to a year actually to, 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 begin, to begin a very early, early, early studies. Uh, and so, yeah, fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you, Vittorio. Uh, next, Greg, uh, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what your company is up to? I certainly would. Uh, let me uh, share my screen and we'll start off. Okay, okay, very good. All right. So uh, I'm with Intervene Immune and uh, we are trying to uh, translate geroscience to the clinic right now. Uh, just to give you the background, uh, from 2015 to 2017, we carried out the TRIM trial, which was uh, aiming to regenerate the thymus and thereby to mitigate immunosenescence. 
Uh, we use three repurposed FDA approved drugs so that the treatment would be vanilla, therefore uh, aimed at early FDA approval. Uh, uh, the FDA did require us to get an IND for the study. It's because it's a novel uh, drug combination but uh, we were granted the IND without any problem and, uh, and the FDA had no concerns about the safety of the trial and the IRB had no concerns about the safety of the trial. Uh, the trial involved nine uh, men between the ages of uh, 51 and 65 years. They were all Caucasians of good health. Uh, and this age range uh, was chosen because it's at the threshold of the immune cliff, uh, which between the ages of 62 and 70, eight uh, years uh, uh, reduces our immune repertoire by about 98%. Next slide, please. Are we? Okay, good, thanks. So when we, when we started the trial, you know, of course we were aimed at immunity, but uh, we knew in the back of our minds that uh, there may be more to uh, re uh, thymus regeneration than just immunity as it relates to aging. And uh, th this is uh, what we had in mind. So on the left, what you see is that if you give young thymus transplants to syngeneic old mice, uh, you do more than just improve their immune system. You also restore beta receptors in the brain and you normalize plasma levels of T3 and of insulin. Uh, and you also reduce the number of tetraploid cells in the liver back to what it is in youth. So uh, these are pretty broad uh, aging uh, effects, anti-aging effects that don't seem to be obviously connected to the immune system in a direct way. And if you do serial thymus transplants, as you see on the right, uh, even though the thymus transplant peters out after about a month or so, if you keep transplanting successively after a month to retain an effect, it looks like uh, there's some, there's some uh, a chance that uh, can actually extend the lifespan as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, of course, had no idea what we were going to get when we did this uh, study, but uh, here's what we got. And, and the results can be divided into three different categories. Uh, the first category is immunological changes, which, of course, was the primary uh, thing that we were looking for. We did improve thymic density, which is classically accepted as a good measure of uh, thymus regeneration. Along the way, we also showed that we increased bone marrow density. So there may be some uh, implications there for bone marrow function, which would be significant also. Uh, we did see signs of an improvement of thymic function in the sense that we saw an increase in recent thymic emigrants and in naive CD4 and CD8 T cells. We also saw this interesting effect of reducing exhausted T cells, uh, specifically PD-1 positive CD8 T cells, which are interesting uh, also because uh, PD-1 is a checkpoint inhibitor that tends to block uh, the rejection of cancers as we get older. We reduce uh, cells with that marker. Uh, we also increased something called the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio which has been correlated with improved outcomes for every kind of cancer that's been studied uh, in that connection and uh, also heart disease, stroke, and inflammation. And we seem to reduce inflammation, at least as measured by CRP levels. We also increase FGF21, which in mice, not only tends to regenerate the thymus, but also tends to increase the lifespan of the mice. So those are the immunological changes. We also saw some changes that seem to be in opposition to aging that are not obviously related to the immune system per se. Uh, and, and one of those is a reduction in PSA, prostate specific antigen, as well as percent free PSA, both of which suggest a possible reduction of prostate cancer risk. We also saw an increase in the estimated GFR, implying uh, improving uh, kidney function over time. And we even saw, uh, to our surprise, a hair re pigmentation in uh, three of our volunteers. The third category was the one that was really surprising and uh, caught us by surprise as well as uh, uh, most other people. Uh, and that is that we saw that compared to the baseline ages of our volunteers, after one year of treatment, uh, epigenetic age is measured in four different ways by four different clocks. 
was one and a half years less than it was at the beginning of the trial. Uh, even though they were actually one year older chronologically, they were 1.5 years younger biologically, at least based on, on these clocks, and that this reversal of epigenetic aging accelerated over time, so that in the last three months of the trial, epigenetic age was running in reverse at the rate of six and a half days for every day of treatment. Uh, in addition, the uh, reversal of epigenetic aging was not correlated with how old the volunteers were when they entered the trial. So as you can see from the statistics, I just chose for the grim age example because grim age is a predictor of longevity in humans, that there's no correlation. You know, R squared is 0 0.04. Uh, and then the other thing as far as uh, translation uh, clinically uh, and FDA approval is concerned is that the side effects that we observed were mild and reversible in all cases. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, where are we going from here? Well, uh, we're starting uh, something we call the TRIM-X trial. That's the extension of the TRIM trial. We're now recruiting. Uh, we have uh, already pre-screened about 25 volunteers who have passed a couple of pre-screening tests. We have 500 people waiting to get onto the uh, list of, of uh, enrollees for the trial. Uh, we're hoping to enroll 10 or 15 uh, volunteers a month starting uh, next month. Uh, and we're gonna be using a telemedicine approach so that we can enroll people from all over the country. Uh, we can't quite go international yet, but that's in the cards uh, maybe a year from now. Uh, and there are gonna be three uh, full treatment groups, uh, full treatment meaning that we're gonna use all three of the meds that we use to regenerate the thymus in the TRIM trial. Uh, and we're gonna use uh, men and women in the same age range as the TRIM age range we're also gonna use older men up to the age of 80. All of our groups will be uh, uh, inclusive of as many minorities as we can include in the, uh, in the trial. Um, and uh, the two uh, reduced treatment groups uh, in, uh, are, are groups that will parse uh, the effect that we see for the presence of growth hormone. So the, the three meds that we use in the trial are growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin. Uh, and there's been controversy about the growth hormone aspect of it. So we're gonna have two groups in which growth hormone is left out. You know, some people feel that metformin may do it all by itself, so we'll find that out. We'll also have one uh, untreated uh, control group. And these uh, last three groups, the, the reduced treatment groups and the control group will all be placebo controlled. Uh, none, of, none of the people, uh, at least the males in, in those groups will, will know if they're on treatment or placebo. Uh, we'll also have hopefully somewhere between 70 and 100 volunteers when all is said and done. And uh, we're gonna add some endpoints to the trial uh, to measure T cell function, the ability to recognize, respond to antigenic challenges, as well as exercise capacity measurements and measures of frailty. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, in the near future, uh, uh, we plan to be talking to the FDA about possible uh, acceptable composite endpoints, as we heard a lot about yesterday, and possibilities of uh, uh, interpreting as accelerated approval to apply to aging models like ours. Maybe even considering this uh, right to try strategy because uh, COVID is killing people. But even before COVID, of course, uh, the flu and, and pneumonia kills mostly older people. Uh, and so uh, it might be uh, feasible to argue that people have the right to try uh, uh, a, an immune regeneration protocol that might save their lives. Uh, meanwhile, we'll be working with the Clock Foundation uh, to advance epigenetic age as a surrogate marker for age-related disease and disability for aging interventions in general. Uh, this would not only benefit our own ability to uh, qualify for FDA approval, but everybody else's ability as well, who, who uh, is using epigenetic age as one of the endpoints of their interventional studies. And uh, we hope to be soon partnering uh, with uh, clinics. There's interesting clinics uh, all over the world uh, in this uh, treatment, and uh, that could uh, accelerate translation as well by uh, increasing access to the treatment. We'll also be working with the uh, XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, they are uh, 
floating an age reversal uh, X prize, uh, which hopefully will stimulate interest in what I call interventive gerontology in general, uh, what we're calling geroscience translation in this panel. Uh, and uh, that may be uh, uh, in ways beyond just uh, recharging the immune system. Uh, the last, but perhaps not least, uh, as we heard uh, yesterday, translation doesn't necessarily work very well if you can't get the insurance companies to buy into it. So we are planning some ins uh, discussions with insurers to uh, see if uh, possible indications like end-stage renal disease, which is very costly, might be worth insuring people for by, uh, by helping to reduce the cost of our treatment. So that's it. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, helping me with the slides and uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, participate in the rest of the discussions. Okay, well, we're running a little bit late. So I think I'm gonna uh, use the, the moderator's prerogative here and say, uh, we're gonna forego the part where we chat among ourselves and proceed right to the question because we have plenty of them. And I'd like to make sure that we got to all of them. So the first one is actually for Vadim, regarding the six life shortening mutations, what's known about the opposite, rare life lengthening mutations as a guide to interventions? Vadim? Yes. Um uh, uh, well, there are many studies that that, uh, that try to identify as longevity variants, uh, for example, focusing on centenarians. And th there are some like APOE and, and, and a few other, but uh, the effect is, is just not strong. So uh, in our study, actually, we wanted to find kind of an alternative. So, so apparently, in addition to the longevity variants, which extend lifespan, all of us have some damaging mutations which shorten lifespan. So we, we need to account for this in clinical trials and um, and, and maybe in the future, uh, consider editing those because they are really damaging. Steve, are you muted? We can't hear you. You need to be muted, Steve. Hello, am I back? You're back. Oh, sorry, my chair caught my microphone. Anyway, the next question, Vadim, is also for you. Um, it says, are your aging signatures tissue specific or are they valid for the whole organism? Uh, uh, apparently, well, it depends, of course, what, what is meant by aging signatures, but we do find uh, common changes across tissues that, that we study. We primarily study in animals, of course, uh, but presumably in humans would be the same. So there are some common, common age-related changes, uh, which are quite significant, yeah. Yeah, so thank you. The next question is asking, maybe this is to the panel generally, what the status is of the clinical translation of synolytics. I know there was that recent failure by Uno, Unity uh, Biotech, but I also know that there are 18 clinical trials going on at the Mayo Clinic of synolytics uh, right now. Anybody have anything else uh, to add about that? Yeah, let me say a few words about that. So sure. um, Unity, people were very, very excited after the phase one trial that reported in to, um, maybe a year ago, which appeared to have quite a significant effect, despite the fact that, of course, it was a very small number of patients. Uh, the placebo effect in the phase two trial was really, really high, even by the standards of osteoarthritis. And Unity are saying that that pretty much explains why there was no significant benefit. Um, however, the really good news from the point of view of investors, and I know there are plenty of those on this call, is that Unity have plenty of money in the bank and they are proceeding um, at full pace with a couple of other trials for different indications in which a placebo effect will be much less of a problem. In addition to, of course, the fact that many other organizations, Mayo being one of the most prominent, are doing other trials. Um, and of course, some of these trials are really small, very much like the first trim, trim trial. In fact, I think the first Mayo clinical trial was also just nine people, same as Trim. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we can be very confident at this point that if there is any truth in the idea that getting rid of senescent cells is good for you in old age, then one or another of these groups will prove, prove that it's good pretty soon now. Yes, I, I mean, I think to, to me, the, the, the real hope of the field is that there are so many things going forward at this simultaneously. So even if some of them don't work out, we have so many possibilities and that's something that's new. It's no longer just eat less, you know, for many years it was just eat less. But uh, so, so um, 
One question that came up here uh, was really for Greg about what drugs are in your IND, but you answered that. Um, here's test. Oh, I guess this is for you also, Greg. How easy was the logistic of the use of Grim Age as an endpoint? Four clocks were reported. What are three others than Grim Age? Right. So, uh, first of all, the logistics of using it were pretty simple, uh, but because there are uh, tendencies for batch variations to take place in, in a lot of different assays. We stored all of the uh, Grimage and other epigenetic clock samples until after the trial was over. And this is a two-year trial because we had two cohorts, uh, each that lasted a year. Or, uh, and so there was uh, some overlap, but basically it took a long time to get the results out the other side. But uh, getting the uh, assay done was not a problem. And now that the clock foundation exists, uh, they're going to facilitate the use of these same clocks by other groups. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more about them uh, going forward. So the other three clocks that we used were the DNA methylation clock, which is the original Horvath clock. We also used uh, Levine's uh, pheno aging clock, pheno age clock, uh, and we used the Hanum clock. And all of the uh, four clocks uh, differed in some ways in terms of the, the actual numbers that were uh, seen, uh, but the magnitudes were comparable uh, across all four clocks, and, uh, and they all told the same story. Uh, and they also, uh, they all showed the effect of uh, accelerating uh, aging reversal, epigenetic aging reversal over time. So uh, uh, even though the clock sometimes uh, will give you different results and sometimes uh, I do so because they measure slightly different things. Uh, they were all kind of unanimous in that uh, epigenetic age uh, seemed to be going in reverse. Oh, good. So another follow-up. Did you look at insulin, insulin changes and glucose, various glucose control? In, in yeah, the so, yeah, so actually that was a central focus of the trial uh, because uh, people have used growth hormone for all kinds of things and all kinds of reasons in the past. And there's really been very poor evidence of any real benefit. I mean, the bodybuilders like it because they build up their muscles and whatnot, but it's not even clear if the muscles are stronger. Uh, but the, the one thing that stands out for growth hormone is the immune system, which has been pretty much neglected by most, uh, most labs to this point. Um, but, uh, but the other thing that's been neglected is the fact that uh, uh, growth hormone administration causes an increase in insulin levels it reduces insulin sensitivity. And uh, if you give massive doses of growth hormone to old animals, uh, their lifespans are absolutely the same as if you don't give them growth hormone. Uh, and that's interesting and peculiar because they must be uh, uh, having their insulin levels go up, but presumably uh, uh, any beneficial effect of growth hormone would be canceling that out. So we didn't want uh, that insulin uh, effect to get in the way of a positive outcome in the, in the human trials. That's the reason that we use metformin and DHEA in combination with growth hormone is to exactly to block the hyperinsulinemic effect of growth hormone. Uh, and, and, and everybody knows that, that uh, metformin increases insulin sensitivity, but it's it, it was really not really known that uh, DHEA does it except in the context of, DHA, of growth hormone itself. So growth hormone uh, is present in high quantities in youth and you don't have hyperinsulinemia when you're young. Uh, but if you give growth hormone to an old person, they become hyperinsulinemic. So I thought, well, maybe that's because the old person also lacks DHEA. And people who have low or unstable levels of DHEA do not do as well with aging as, as normal people. I mean, other people who have better uh, DHEA levels. Uh, and so we tried it and uh, Initially, I found in myself that DHEA lowers uh, insulin levels after GH administration, and then we found in the TRIM trial it was the same. So we weren't able to totally suppress insulin elevation. We still have some work to do in that regard, but uh, we certainly uh, uh, elevated insulin less than we would have if we had not intervened, and we have statistical proof of that. So um, th I think that that's the answer to the question about insulin. So uh, following up, I noticed in your trial, and, and, and maybe Vittorio, this would, 
you could chime in here as well and anyone else that at least in your initial trial, it was all males. And uh, one of the things that's come out of a lot of the animal work is that uh, many of the putative uh, interventions for aging are, have sex specific effects. And so I guess I'm curious of, of why there were only males in the first trial and whether in your follow-up trial, you're going to include both sexes. And I know the immune system has some sexual dimorphism, which is why I thought Vittorio might want to pop up here. I'll let Vittorio comment first if he wishes to. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm just having some issues with my camera. I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but I'm here. <laughs> we can hear you fine. <laughs> Great. Uh, no, that, 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 that's, that's an, excellent, uh, an excellent question. Uh, you know, uh, academically or, you know, from the, from the research standpoint, I mean, we have always, we have, we have confirmed our findings both uh, in male uh, and female uh, cells. So we, we, have all, we have always dealt with human samples. Uh, so primary, primary cells derived from, uh, from human tissues, from elderly individuals. Well, depending on the, on the cell type, of course, elderly is, is relative. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, we have always dealt with, you know, cells coming from uh, individuals 65 or, or, or older. Um, and we have, we have actually collected on purpose samples from both males and females uh, to really demonstrate that actually that, you know, at, the, uh, at least at the cellular level, you know, the, the, the effect is, uh, is the same. Now, uh, the, Steve, the question is, is great because it, when then you extrapolate, let's say, the findings, you know, from the ex vivo derived, uh, you know, uh, therapy, to in vivo therapy, then you have to actually deal with a lot of other conf confounding or, you know, um, com yeah, to, to some extent confounding issues like, you know, fertility, immune senescence. Uh, in males and females, there seems to be, you know, kind of an opposite trend when it comes to fertility. So, you know, early menopause in, 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 in women is correlated with higher rate of mortality and higher rate of morbidity. Uh, in males, it seems to be the opposite. Uh, so there is a lot, a lot, a lot to, to deal with uh, and kind of the crosstalk between the, the gonads, the thymus and, uh, and the hypothalamus, pituitary glands uh, and, adrenal, and adrenal gland kind of axis, you know, that's also very important, but we, we are still far from, from understanding that. So that's, I, I don't know if I answered the question. I think I opened up more questions, but that's, that's my. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the best kind of answer, Vittorio. Um, Greg, did you want to chime in on this too? Sure, yeah, sure. So uh, there were no women in the trim trial for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that no women volunteered to participate. All of our volunteers <laughs> just happened to be male. So uh, we filled up our slots and, and went forward with it. But the other reason was that I wasn't confident about designing a trial for women at the time. Women are much less well studied uh, in terms of growth hormone administration and immune senescence than men are. Uh, uh, most of the studies in humans up to our point had been done on HIV patients, which are predominantly males. Uh, so I just wasn't ready at the time. Uh, we're now ready. Uh, we think we've uh, figured out how to and a woman, so the trim X trial will definitely include an equal number of women. Okay, I, I guess a final question. It looks like we're almost out of time, but are there are there barriers? Are there regulatory or other <laughs> barriers to to do doing these uh, uh, clinical trials with these things in, in people? Well, uh, the barriers are that you that there's a series of hoops that you have to jump yeah. through. Uh, so you have to write a trial plan uh, that uh, an institutional review board will approve, and you uh, have to uh, like sometimes get uh, FDA approval if the IRB uh, says that they're not comfortable approving the trial without yeah. FDA oversight. So uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, uh, the first hoop is the IRB, and then uh, in our case, the IRB referred us to the FDA. We were trying to argue to the IRB that we didn't need FDA approval for this trial because everything that we were looking at had already been approved by the FDA, but they didn't see it that way. And the FDA didn't see it that way either. They saw this as a new drug entity because it's a, it's a new combination of agents. Uh, uh, so we did have to go to the FDA and get them uh, to approve the trial. But uh, in our case, uh, because of the way we designed this uh, trial and this treatment, 
uh, the, the approval just sailed right through. And we, we think that will also be true when we uh, finally apply for approval of, of the treatment for clinical use. Uh, but we will, see. we will see. All right. Well, we'll thank. I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists. I'd like to thank the people that uh, that sent in questions. Uh, I think this is a very thought-provoking uh, session. And now we all look forward into hearing uh, our keynote address. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Robert, thank you so much, Steve. Thanks so much to the panel.